Hello, it's Dawn, and this is Dawn Versations. I'm so happy to have you here. We talk about anything and everything. It's just a potpourri of topics, and that's just the way I like it. If you like surprises and you like variety, this is the show for you. Let's go. Welcome to another episode of Dawn Versations. Today, we have Eric Owen Russell. I love your name, by the way. It's Thank you. It's a great name. Um, how are you doing today? Thank you so much for being here. You know, doing absolutely great. It's really fantastic to be here. And thank you for inviting me. It's always good to meet new people and have conversations with um, people across the country, people across the world who are intersecting other people's lives in positive ways. Yeah. And more and more and more of that, it seems these days, right? A hundred percent. Um, yeah, I came across Eric on Instagram and I just love it when I reach out to somebody that I just get to watch on my phone. And then I was like, I want to have an, a conversation with him. You're so interesting. And I love your messages, just things that you say, if they don't speak to me that day, I know they're going to speak to me at some point someday. I love the way you word things. So you're great at what you do. What got you into coaching? Say more about me being great. No, just <laughs> I love your scarf. I... <laughs> yeah, no. So what, how'd you get into coaching? Well, the start of it all really was in, when we talk about formal coaching was in college. When I was in school, I had an opportunity to work with a master coach who really took me underneath his wing and began the process of mentoring me in college. But the degree program that I was working in really all shaped and provided, shall we say, the academic background for the work I do in terms of coaching, because the degree program that I worked in was in organizational behavior. And if anybody doesn't know what that is, it basically is a study of human growth and development in organized systems, typically in any type of organization. And an organized system is anything from a business to a family, a community, mm -hmm. any type of structure where they're human beings and they're together in an organized way. So that provided me with the educational background for the work I do, and then having really the good fortune of working with a master coach who really provided the overall practical training and then mentoring for many years after I got out of school, got me actually the technical work of coaching. But it doesn't really answer your question, does it? How did <laughs> you become a coach? And let's, let's dig into the why. Yeah. I am, I believe, this is going to sound a little weird, but I believe that one of the reasons why I exist in the world today is really to help people. This has been a, uh, a drive of mine ever since I was small, is that thought of someone could use help in some way, shape, or form. And I think that a lot of that was informed by my own growing up being one of those kids, one of those people, you know, those kids you see that are bullied and left mm. out and excluded. And I don't uh, like that. I, know, I, know. I don't like that. <laughs> no one likes that. And I grew no. up uh, in that world. So I really had a strong sense of what it was like to be othered, if you will, and not included with everyone else. And based on, I think, some of those initial experiences, combining that with the fact that, you know, I was never much good in school, particularly in my younger years. And mm -hmm. much of that had to do with the fact that I needed glasses. I couldn't see. And by the way, these are readers. I wear contact lenses. Okay. And that, that's corrected my vision. But I didn't figure that out until about... Uh, it must have been maybe sixth grade or so when I uh, got a note home. My mom read it, said to my dad, Eric can't read the board. I couldn't read the board. Yeah, I've Just, been there. Yep. Yeah, right. So I couldn't read the board. And as a result, a lot of the ways that we develop our abilities to learn, um, I had missed 
So I had to develop different ways of learning. And I was mm-hmm. kind of an other learner anyway. But once I got glasses, I was able to begin the process of catching up. But I never actually was able to master the traditional ways, if you will, that people learn. I always learned differently. Mm-hmm. As, and because of that, I spent a lot of time in high school and in college getting tutored, getting help, getting whatever it took from my teachers to get me through school. So I am so grateful for people like uh, my chemistry teacher, Herb Basso, who has since passed on, my English teacher, Peter Reinke, all of these teachers that would meet with me in high school after school and literally sit with me and help me learn. So here's a funny story I'll share with you. Now you yes, do chemistry, please. You know how to do chemistry equations? Like, well, I didn't take chemistry. So the <laughs> fact that you did, I'm like, okay, <laughs> you didn't well, think I, you were smart. <laughs> I had to take chemistry in high school. So the equation is it's H2O. So it's two hydrogens plus one oxygen equals water. And then you draw the equation, but like the box, but hydrogen, little two plus box right. oxygen. Then you put a little equal sign and you put H2O on the other end. I used to do those equations this way. The hydrogen, the two plus an oxygen, then I would write something like divine intervention. And then I would put the answer oh, on the other side. Oh, and that's funny. The Herb Basso, who was my chemistry teacher in high school, he comes up to me, he comes, asked me to say after, after class one day, and he says, uh, Russ, Russ, he's called me Russ, Sheriff Russell. He goes, uh, I think I think we need to uh, I think we need to talk about how you're doing chemistry. I was like, uh, okay. He was like, because you know he saw my cry for help. <laughs> oh, how funny! And he helped, as did all of these other teachers. And I'm talking about from history to math to chemistry to all kinds of subjects. They met with me and helped me learn. And I wouldn't be the person I am today. I would not have learned. I wouldn't have ended up at some shishi Ivy League school. And even there, help all the time to learn. So this really inspired me to want to become a teacher. And I wanted to teach because I knew that people needed, like me, needed help through school. And that's when I bumped into this master coach. And it was a perfect storm because he helped me through the life moments for my life. Mm. And I had teachers help me through the academic moments, the professors in the college. And it was just the absolute perfect confluence of things that said, this could be your life work. Oh, wow. It's work of helping other people get further through their lives, particularly through the sticking points of their lives mm-hmm. when they're going into difficulty like my life was at that point in time. Right. Um, Get out the other end. So that's how I got into the coaching world and coaching professions. I've been doing this since 1982, uh, just a couple of years. (laughs) Just a few years. Um, Yeah. So did you always like to read? I was an avid reader growing up. My parents, um, I was one of seven kids. Oh. And my parents used to shop at what we call a, what still is the Acme Market in Philadelphia, which was a couple of miles from where I grew up. It was a local neighborhood market. And across the street from the Acme Market was the Lovett Memorial Library, still there to this day. Well, they would drop us off at the library so they could have their date night shopping in the supermarket. <laughs> <laughs> well, seven kids, they needed to do something. <laughs> so we would go into the library, we'd get books, we'd sit around, read books until they were done. They'd come pick us up and we'd all go home again. And they enrolled us in the summer reading clubs and all kinds of things like that. And that's probably one of the major reasons why I'm why my eyesight is the way it is, because I was one of those kids who would sit in the room, shared a room with my older brother, Keith. Mm-hmm. I'd sit in my bed, pull the sheets up, a flashlight out, and <laughs> just read and read and read and read and read. Yeah. I love to read too. Like go to the library and I'd check out like 15 books. Like I was going to be able to read all 15. Right? <laughs> I just think like, I want them all. Um, no. I. So what do you like to read? Because you, you go deep. 
So what do you like to read? What speaks to you when you grab a book? What kind of, what authors do you like or what books do you like? Okay. I didn't know we were going to have library time, but let's get it. <laughs> <laughs> I told you it's going to go all over the place. <laughs> so this is fantastic. A long time ago when I was working, because I've been doing coaching for a long time, but also I've had other careers too. So I was in the banking world for a very long period of time, worked in financial services. So a very long time ago, there was a very wise man who was talking about leaders and leadership. And what he said was every great leader has at least three books that they're working on, or this, this was his prescription. You need to mm -hmm. work on three books. Number one, you need a book that's industry specific. And that will always help keep you sharp and focused on what's happening or what has happened or what is going on or what will happen within your industry. So always have that book on your bedside table. He said, the next book you need to be working on is a book of fiction. He said, because fiction is great for the imagination and for creativity. And that is one of the, one of the essential skills that every leader has to have is a creative ability, creative mindset, an understanding of life that goes beyond the facts and figures mm -hmm. into what could be the possibilities and the potentials of life. And then the third book he always said that you should have on your night side table, or at least have going, is a great biography. Mm -hmm. He said, the reason why you want the biographies is because you want to be reading about historic events, real characters and people from history, how they lived, what they did, how they thought, how they traversed through life, because that informs how we act, how we are, and how we move through life. And I was like, hmm, let me take some notes on that because I think I'm going to do that. And as you can tell, I took some notes on that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really. You just rolled that out. I love that. So the books I have, because you asked that question, is um, right now I have uh, queued up to read the biography of General Grant. Hmm. So I've got that queued up to read. I am in the middle of, well, I've actually finished it, kind of like brushing some pages off. It's a book called A Season of Darkness. No, not A Season of Darkness. It's called Opening to Darkness by a woman by the name of Zenju Earthlin Manuel. She's from Oakland, California, and she's a Zen Buddhist monk. Oh, wow. Um, that happening. Well, it's finished. I'm just, like I said, I'm dusting some pieces off of that. <laughs> And I'm also working on that controversial book, the 1619 Project, when I get through that one. And I haven't heard of that. Oh, it's it's an interesting book. Check that one out. So I'm 16 working what? 16? 1619 Project. Okay. So I'm working through that. And I'm looking for some other books to read. I have some recommendations if you'd like them. I love ideas of books because I'm always hopeful that I've already read it. <laughs> It's like, oh, okay. So here is a book that I finished that's kind of been circulating among friends of mine. It's called The Memory Police. Okay. I've not heard of that. Yeah. <laughs> Pretty good. If anyone who's going to watch this podcast has read it right now, it's going, oh, oh, The Memory <laughs> Police. <laughs> is it current? Is it fairly new? I, probably within the past couple of years okay. it's by a author from Japan translated into English. And I'm not even going to give a spoiler alert, but okay, yeah. everyone I've talked to that has finished the book, gotten to the end, they've gone, what? <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it's one of those books. It's like, what? When you get to the end of the book. And I, I read the end of the book. I was like, oh, no. No, nah, no, nah. you can't do me like that. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. Well, I still want to read it. Um, so I was saying before I hit record that it was good to see you smiling because when I see you on Instagram, you're very matter of fact and, you know, not, I don't want to say preaching, but just, you know, coaching. And um, you said, well, you get people when they're kind of at a really tough time of their lives. So that's what they need. They need that. How how do you get these people 
how do you, how do they find you and what do you, what are the common problems that you're helping them with? That's a, a really great question. So I'm going to answer it in uh, a variety of ways, but I want to, I want to say it in a way that's going to make as much sense as possible. Okay. okay. Social media is a, a great way to have a chance to say something. And it's particularly helpful if you have something to say that actually is important, especially helpful if you have something to say that is able to touch another human being in an important way. Social media is one of the most important platforms that I use to be able to take about 45 seconds or so in a reel and say something that might be meaningful to someone else. And that is one of the ways in which people will listen and say, that resonates mm -hmm. have a conversation with this person because what they said resonated with me. That's what I did. <laughs> and many of the things, most of the things I talk about, as we talked about before you hit record, I am very focused and I am very directed because I'm speaking into a circumstance that someone is in right now that's hard for them. Yeah. And it isn't in that moment that we are lighthearted and happy and gay and free and at liberty just to joke and yeah. have a good time. They are looking for, they are needing, they are wanting some answer, some solution to their life circumstance. And we need to meet them where they are. And it's almost going to be at a point of sadness It'll be at a point of worry, at a point of distress, at a point of hardship, at a point of life being too hard for them in that moment. And when we're in that moment, I think of it this way. I often describe hardship and difficult circumstances as an accident that has happened. What do you do when rescue shows up? There's no laughter there. There's right. an assessment, there's an understanding. Our focus right now is immediate trauma relief at that point in time. We need to inter we need to intervene immediately right now. We need to get them assessed. We need to get them medical help. We need to get them to a hospital because we're dealing with a situation that can go south and we don't want that to happen. So what are we here to do? And that's my work. What am I here to do? I am here to get you to the point where you're laughing. Yeah. Like, right. Like, right. We begin there. We begin someplace else. So really the work that I do and you see on Instagram mm -hmm. social platforms is very focused. It's very serious. It really is to acknowledge where you're at right now. It's to provide you with an initial um, understanding of where you are, a direction that you can take some help that you can immediately get so that you can begin the process of moving through your situation. Because where you are today won't be where you'll be in another 120 days, another 10 days. And next sure, day. yeah. Part of the biggest challenge that we're faced with when we're in these difficult moments, and you do this, I do this, we all do this, is we take today and today's hard moment, and then we project out for the rest of our lives that this is exactly what it's going to be. Yeah. And that's just not true. Right. We have to move you past that initial trauma, if you will, to get to the place where you're able to see down the road and understand that where you are today doesn't determine where you will be tomorrow. But we have to intersect at the point in the place where you are. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, yeah, a hundred percent. It reminded me. I don't want to get, lose my train of thought, but I will. Um, it reminded me of the Mister Rogers when he was talking about his mom and how they were watching TV and there was something that was really catastrophic. I can't remember exactly what it was, and she, he was little and he was afraid. And she told him, "Look for the helpers. Look for the helpers on there." And that's what I felt like when you were saying that, like you're there to help and paramedics are there to help and to calm, to try and calm the situation down so that you can get a little bit of clarity so that you can retain the information that you have to share with people, which I think is just beautiful. Um, I saw a thing too, that you were talking about COVID 
and how it was forcing people to be still. And, you know, there were so many bad things with COVID, but at the same time, gosh, it did a lot of people a world of good too. A lot of people needed that time to sit down and reflect on where they were in their life, where things were going in their world, who they wanted to be, where they wanted to be. So it's crazy that it took a pandemic for that to happen to people. But, you know, we are, we're all like robots. We're going to work. We're doing this. We're doing, making dinner. You know, it's hard to stop and be still. It's easy to say it, but it's hard to do it. How do you, how do you help people to actually do it that say they're just too busy? They can't do that. Yeah, thank you for that. And that's a really good question. And COVID is a terrific example because often you can't tell someone to slow down and stop. Life has to slow them down and stop them. And again, that's often where I intersect another human being's life. Life has said, oh, you're not going to do that right now because this thing has happened. Mm -hmm. And life slows them down and it shuts them down. And it's interesting because at that point, and if anyone who, who ends up listening to this or watching this, if they're in a situation, it's really difficult and it's really hard. One of the hardest things for them to be able to do in this moment is to see and understand the opening that they're being presented with. That's hard. And it's hard for a lot of reasons. One is, as you talked about, the routine that we're programmed into. I have a theory behind that, that much of our understanding and our ideas around our notion of productivity, you know, the saying, if you have time to lean, you have time to clean. Yeah. Or just that sense of, if I'm not doing something, I should be doing something. I feel guilty about it. Yes rest, relaxation. Mm -hmm. I feel guilty about the fact that I'm not doing something. Without getting too deep in the weeds, a lot of that idea came from the industrial revolution when human productivity began to be measured by machine productivity, where we stop, think of the farmer in the mm -hmm. field, understanding that their productivity was bounded by, first of all, light from dawn till dark. That's as long as you could work. Right. When the Industrial Revolution came, there also came the invention of the incandescent light bulb, which meant factories now could run all of the time because they had light. Mm -hmm. The second change that happened with the Industrial Revolution is, again, they called it the machine age, Productivity began to be measured again, not by the human, how strong you were, how hard you could work, how fast you could go, but by machines, you could go at a constant rate of speed, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And you always had that picture in your mind of the worker at the end of an assembly line or the end of a, a, an assembly belt doing something at the speed of the machine. Right. That began to define what productivity actually is. And once that mindset began to become embedded in our human psyche and the way that we approach life, it has now infected us to the point where we think that we have to constantly always be doing something. And it's become part of how, particularly here in the West, in the U.S., how we view our own culture and mm -hmm. how we view the notion of productivity. That has changed even again in the digital age, in the digital revolution, where we go even faster because the advances in digital technology are moving at such a rapid pace that it's hard for us to even to keep up with the changes that are coming right. and that have already happened. And as a result, we're moving faster and faster and faster and faster and faster. And it often isn't until our bodies break through exhaustion, through getting sick, through just being tired, through being frustrated, through realizing that the quality of life that we want is never going to be met through this kind of lifestyle if you want. 
that we pull back, that we sit down, that we reevaluate and we decide that we need to make a different decision, a decision that says, I got to slow myself down. Right. And it's often when we are, when we are forcibly still because we might've lost a job and I don't wish that upon anybody because we might've gotten sick. Again, I don't wish that on anybody because we might've run into a, a difficult situation, whatever it is. I don't wish those situations upon any, on anyone that we have an opportunity. There's an opening to reevaluate how we are living our lives. And again, that's often the point of intersection that I meet up with people, that people reach out to me and say, can we talk? And in that, we have a chance to get still. We have a chance to understand what it is actually like to enjoy life to sit outside and watch mm -hmm. a moon rise, to be in the presence of a sunrise, to spend time with the ones we love, to actually participate in some activities that we enjoy. Like one of the things that happened during the pandemic was so many people got outdoors, right? Yes. You couldn't find a bike anywhere. There were no bikes in the stores. People, families were all riding bikes together. And the hiking trails were packed. It was a different experience for us all. Yeah. And in many ways, and this is, this is actually phenomenal. There was a leveling of society in many ways because of that. Mm -hmm. Because everybody got out and hiked. Everybody got on bikes and rode around. There wasn't a matter anymore of the highways jammed with people driving everything from six-figure cars to right. beaters and junkers on the road. People were just out on bikes. People were just out on walks. People were just out in the woods. Just people out being. Yeah. And yeah, it was so weird too because the world, we were, everybody in the world was experiencing something at the same time. It didn't matter if you were rich or poor or black or white or whatever, everybody was stopped. Yeah. Oh, it's just such a crazy thing. Um, and I had, I told you ahead of time, I was going to ask you a question <laughs> and I haven't even asked you the question yet that we were supposed to talk about. So we were talking about social media yeah. and also when you were a child and, and feeling left out and not accepted and all that. It's a horrible feeling. If anybody hasn't experienced that, I wouldn't wish it on anybody. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. So that kind of happens now in the digital age where likes, you're wanting that dopamine hit and getting the likes, you know, how many people have liked my video? How many followers do I have? It's mm -hmm. all about feeling like you want to be the popular one right? and not everybody's going to like you. And that's a hard pill to swallow that not every and then people are vocal about it <laughs> like you suck and it's like oh my god <laughs> like do you have advice for people when me personally I want everybody to like me I know it's terrible it's not gonna happen I know I talk too loud and too much and all that but what do you say to people if they have that feeling of rejection or not being part of the group or it's so apparent now that you can just see it you can see who's popular <laughs> You can just look online. Mm. What do you do for people that are troubled like me that want everybody to like them all the time? <laughs> yeah, well, I think that you hit the, the initial nail on the head, which is just the realization that that's not going to happen. You're not going to be liked by everyone, right? Yeah. You, just, you need to be liked by, by those people who are going to like you. Mm -hmm. Everybody else, whatever. But rejection is rejection's hard for us. And it's hard for us for a lot of biological reasons, a lot of sociological reasons. It's hard for us, but we can withstand rejection. And there's, there's three things that I talk about when it comes to the ability to withstand rejection. The first one hey, is kind of- I'm getting ready? my pen. <laughs> All right. so, so the first one is kind of hard for a lot of people. Um, and that's called being affirmatively defiant. And, and what that means is this, I show up the way I want to show up, no excuses. I show up the way I want to show up, no excuses. 
And that is an affirmation. And it's a strong and powerful one because it confirms that I am going to show up wherever it is the way I the way I want to. And the interesting thing about rejection is that we often look at rejection as this end of the world event. It isn't because often what rejection is and the way I've often looked at it is that it positively confirms that I showed up the way I wanted to show up. That I am me. If, if you're going to reject me I for being it. me, yeah, if you're going to reject me for being me, good on you because I did it right. <laughs> yeah, that was me you rejected. I'm right. okay with that. Right. I'm fine with me. So if you're going to reject me, I'm good. It's so you're going to positively confirm that I showed up exactly the way I wanted to. And for many people, this is new and strange and different. This is not an approach to life that most people, I'm just going to say that most people want to take. They see rejection as something awful, as terrible, as horrible, not as it positively confirming something about them that they either wanted or that they needed to know. And both of those two are excellent outcomes. Hmm. Now, the second thing is equally as important, which is this. What is the second one? I go to the third one. <laughs> well, don't I go to the third me. one, which is which is really important. Which is, I don't need anyone to approve me. I approve myself. And I'll get back to the second one. It'll come in just a second. But I approve myself. Now, the reason why this one is so important is really simple, Don. We don't get trained to approve ourselves. When you're in school, you get trained to be approved by somebody else. Every single time you take a test in school, what you're being trained into was, how did I do? Who is approving me? And then at what level are they determining my acceptability? Is it a C level of acceptability? A B or an A level acceptability. And yeah. we think all about proficiency, all right? We're thinking about proficiency. Well, I was a C level proficiency or a B level proficiency or an A level proficiency. That's not necessarily all that's there. Yeah. The rest of that equation has to do with how acceptable am I as compared, especially to my peers and in the eyes of the person who's doing the approving. But it sets us up to seek others' approval yeah. and our own approval. I don't and, like that. Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's why the transition has to happen to our ability to approve ourselves. We set our own standards. We will become acceptable and accepted to ourselves. That also helps us to become, like I say, to be able to withstand rejection. Mm-hmm. Now, the second thing in terms of withstanding rejection is the ability to stand alone or by yourself if you need to. This is difficult, but it's mm -hmm. difficult because we as humans are social creatures. We want to be with the crowd. We want to be with our friends. No one wants to be on the outside. And from a standpoint of a million years ago when we were on the savannah, to be left out of the group meant certain death. It's this drive to be included with everybody else, but we're not living on a savannah anymore. And we do have the ability to stand alone. But can I define that for you? Yeah. Standing alone means understanding who you are, what you are, why you are, in a way that is independent from getting that sense, your sense our sense of identity from the group members. That's very different. So when you have a person who is able to really see themselves as separate from, even yet still being a part of the group, that's a person who has the ability to stand alone because their identity, if you will, who they are, is not necessarily completely wrapped up with the group the ability to stand outside of that. 
That sounds so really healthy. <laughs> yeah. So those are the three ways. If we can develop these three ways of being, and I have three affirmations that go with that. The first affirmation is basically, I will show up the way, exactly the way I want to. The second affirmation, I will, I will courageously show up exactly the way I want to. The second affirmation is I have the strength to stand alone if I need to. And the third affirmation is I approve me. I don't need your approval. So those are the three affirmations that we want to be saying over and over and over and over and over again. Put that on repeat because that's the way that we reprogram our minds mm-hmm. so that we can become able to withstand the rejection of other people. Right. And that's for any age because any. I'm sure you wish somebody would have told you that, pulled you aside when you were in third grade or whatever and just said, you don't need them. You don't need to be going to their party. Figure yeah. out what you like figure out what Eric likes. Yeah. I love that. Were you, uh, spiritual growing up or are you, or yeah, we grew up in a very spiritual and religious household. I don't tell a lot of people, but I'll tell your whole audience. I used to be a pastor. That's that makes sense. <laughs> that makes sense. Well, here's the thing. I always see myself not necessarily as a pastor, but as a shepherd. And I, I just, describe this to so many of my friends and others when they meet me as I have a shepherd's heart. I care deeply for other human beings, for what happens to them, how they get along in life, how they're faring. If they have trouble, difficulty, or hardship, I want to be part of the process that helps them along and helps them to be better. That informs a lot of uh, who I am and how I am in the world. I drive through difficult parts of the world and difficult situations and I want to change them. I want things to be different for those human beings. Um, and part of that informs the work I do. And maybe that's why I have this deep sense of or just sensibility to be involved in people's lives when their lives are at their lowest points. Mm. Well I love that you took it and spun it around. You know what was hard for you as a child and being the underdog and you're turning it around and using that as a superpower to help people. So I love that. What's next for you? Do you want to write a book? I've written a book. We're working. Sorry. (laughs) Yeah, no, we're good. We're working on getting a literary agent right now so we can get that in the hands of publishers and get it out. It's called when life comes apart, practical wisdom and guidance on what to do. So it is going to be a book that will provide um, an observation that I've made on life from clients or just from life in general. It'll provide my thinking or commentary about that. And then I'll have a lot of space so that people have a chance to journal in that space, Mm. do some written reflection, doodle, whatever, because writing Creative writing, journaling is one of the best ways for us to deal with difficult and hard situations. There is so much science behind this. It's crazy. But okay, it, you have to tell me why. Okay. <laughs> what what <laughs> this is gonna go until <laughs> five mm-hmm. hours later. <laughs> so what happens when we biologically what happens when we are in a difficult situation? And most for those of you who do not know is your body responds with self-defense or self-protection in the face of threat. Mm -hmm. The part of the brain that makes that happen is the amygdala. When the amygdala fires, it basically turns on. It prepares the body for self-defense and self-protection. So there is a biological, not a logical reaction, reaction, not response, but reaction to the potential threat. When that happens, many things go offline. Uh, Digestion stops. Urge to reproduce stops. Um, The prefrontal cortex, the place where rationality is or higher thinking, uh, impulse control, that slows or shuts down. Wow. Everything is overridden by the biological imperative to live. Everything, because wow. our, our our the imperative for us is towards life. The bias is survival, which is the reason why you can't reason with people who are in 
fight or flight. Yeah. Because that part of the brain is off. Mm. It's just not on. So in those moments, as you prepare, respiration increases because you got to get more air mm-hmm. into the red blood cells, more red blood cells into the body so the body can do all the things it needs to do. Muscles tighten for action. The body gets ready to spring and to move. And all of these things happen. Pupils dilate, taking more eye, taking more light. All these things happen. Hearing sharpens. All of these almost primitive things Mm -hmm. that would get this organism, this human animal ready to do what it needs to do in order to keep itself alive. But one of the things that's not part of that equation is higher math. That's just (laughs) That's never been a good part of my life. (laughs) We don't don't need higher math. We don't need to figure out the the, the chemical chemical equation compounds of water. It's unnecessary. <laughs> All we know is that the flood is coming and yes. it's made up of water. How do we battle the water? That's all we need to know. We don't need yeah. to know how it's made up. We just need to know that it's there. So anyway, right. So here's the thing. Most of us are in an initial reaction to the threat. The problem is we don't get out of that initial reaction quickly. It's one thing if you see a saber-toothed tiger in front of the cave And then three minutes later, you see it running off into the forest somewhere. The threat's over. You can come back to life. Mm -hmm. Most of the challenges that so many of us face, let's say job loss, death, uh, the big things, job loss, divorce, these types of things, when they happen to us, down to the little things or, 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 or things that we would consider to be less significant, but still they are ongoing. Mm-hmm. And because it's ongoing, we don't get past the reactive stage. Right. We don't get past the reactive stage. The prefrontal cortex, executive function, higher reason and thought never comes back online. Mm. We are always living in fight or flight, the stressed state of threat. Okay. Right. So the way that you can get out of that is you have to turn the rest of the brain back on. Journaling by hand, and there's a reason why helps to reboot that process Hmm. because of what's required. So what happens when you journal is you have to, first of all, it is by hand, it's fine motor skills. That's housed in another part of the brain rather than the amygdala. Mm -hmm. But that part of the brain isn't required unless, of course, you're pulling a bow back or throwing something or pulling a trigger. That part of the brain is typically not required. You're not in the middle of threat writing notes. You're not Mm -hmm. writing Okay, so you need to turn that back on. So the handwriting begins to turn that part of the brain back on where fine motor skills are. When you're journaling, you're remembering information that turns the memory part of the brain back on again. Some of it is in the amygdala, but the rest of it is in the rest of the brain. You got to that fires back up again. Then you're remaining. Then you're remembering time. Well, what did happen when? Okay. And then when you start to remember, well, what did that mean? Now you're thinking. Now your brain is processing and all these different parts of the brain begin to light up and come back on again. That's why the, that's why there's so much power in journaling and especially journaling by hand because it gets you out of reaction, calms the biology down, mm-hmm. enables you to start to think again and to process again so that you can get into an actual real response because there are five to six stages of getting out of your problem. There's the initial reaction. And then there's the process of recognition. Recognition is, so what did happen? Right. I was in a car accident. That's what happened. Then there's realization. Oh my gosh, I was in a car accident. That means I don't have a car anymore. Am I hurt? Am I injured? That type of thing. The realization. Mm -hmm. There is reconciliation. Reconciliation is actually where we begin to actually apply meaning to exactly what happened. And then there is actual real response. Real response is actually, so now what do I do? Yeah. And I take all the way to actual resolution of the problem. Those are what I call the six stages that you get through. So oh, that was my turn. <laughs> I'm like so listening. I said, oh, it's my turn. <laughs> so that, that was a lot. No, but it was but, so interesting because it's true when you're in the, the heat of the moment. You're, you're 
brain and your body, everything just takes over. It's like, if you're mad, you know, you see red, that's all you see and you can't. So do you free write? Is it, do you do, uh, it doesn't have to make sense. It doesn't really just, you start writing, just start writing. jello, bubble gum, coffee, yeah. just let it go. Okay. Whatever flies, whatever comes out, that's what you, that's what you focus on. I love that. Um, there is a, uh, whose name escapes me, but he's at UT Austin. Uh, Brene Brown talks about him. He's a professor. His name will come to me, of course, when we're done. Um, yep, he, <laughs> that's the way it works. He's one of the foremost authorities in, in the country these days and researchers on uh, creative writing and its benefits. Okay. And I believe Renee Brown mentioned his name in her series that was on, I believe it was HBO or Netflix. Okay. She talked about uh, about this particular professor, but he really ha is the, uh, he's the OG when it comes to creative yeah. Uh, it's just fascinating. It really is. Well, tell people how they can find you if they want to get a hold of you, if they want your coaching, all of that. Well, you can find me. Let's start with social media because that's where so many people are. You can find me on social media at this site. You can look up my name, Eric Owen Russell, or you can search me by the by my page name, which is Growth through adversity coaching, all one word, G-R-O-W-T-H-T-R-O-U-G-H, adversity coaching. That's got tired of spelling. <laughs> <laughs> you did great. <laughs> um, you can find me there. You can, that's Instagram. Um, you can look up by, me by name. You can find me on LinkedIn, or you can just go straight to my website, which is ericowenrussell.com. You just find out everything about me is in all those places. Awesome. Well, when your book is released, book it comes out. Yes, yeah, I want to read it. So you'll have to make sure you put it out there when it's released. And if you want to come back and talk about it, I'd love it. I'd love to hear about it. Yeah. Happy, happy, happy to come back. That's so great. Thank you. I'm so sorry for me being just as sporadic as I am, but that's We're me. Good. I'm embracing me. <laughs> <laughs> that's just who I am. But I appreciate your time so very much. You have a wonderful smile. So show it a little bit more on Instagram. People will benefit from that too. But thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. And I will be in touch very soon. Sounds great. Thanks, Don. Wonderful to be here. Appreciate you having me. Thank you. All right. We'll see you later. Bye-bye.